Next, I want to hand it off to Allison Muth. And Allison, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, I'll just uh, read your bio while you do that and get situated. So Allison began at Penn State in 2004. Whoa working with the Pennsylvania Forest Stewards Volunteer Program and conducting outreach to forest landowners across the state and beyond. She is now an assistant research professor and director of the Center for Private Forests at Penn State and continues to work at the intersection of people and forests. Allison has degrees in forestry and an ED with an emphasis in collaborative learning. She has worked in the forest industry for private consulting firms and has a strong interest in peer learning and in creating dialogue to advance understanding of forest stewardship issues and opportunities. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Allison. So much Dakota. Um, I'm happy to be here today and excited to be part of the kickoff of this uh, webinar series. Um, one of the things I didn't put in my bio, I do recognize some names in the participant list, especially folks who participated in Pennsylvania's and or Mid-Atlantic Region Women in Their Woods programming uh, this last year. So you, you may get a little bit of repetition for those of you who were part of our virtual retreat. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was to kick off with a poll. Um, so Leonora, if you don't mind launching this poll, uh, what do trees need to grow? And I will admit, so this is should be able, um, oh, it looks like it's only gonna let you choose one thing. Oh, I'd, I'd, I would hoped it would be a choose all but apply um, or multiple choice, um, right? People can't choose more than one. Um, I, I, I think I could. Can. Okay, good, 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 good. I, I couldn't tell based on my screen. So I have to admit that um, I, I often do this at, at Woodlot tour with first and second graders. And I always ask them this question to what do trees need to grow? So I did steal some, some of their responses uh, for this question. So I just wanna give it a minute. Um, I, I don't know if everybody can see it, but um, Leonora, if you don't mind ending and we'll share. Um, majority said, what do trees need to grow? They need water, nutrients, light, dirt, um, oxygen, uh, space was on the upper list. Uh, let's see, insects, oxygen, fertilizer, and friends. Um, yeah, less, less necessary. So yeah, you all, you all know more than first and second graders. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about in uh, my part of the presentation is, is this exactly. What do trees need to grow and why do they grow where they grow? So basically trees need four things to grow, water, soil and nutrients, light um, for photosynthesis, and space. Um, competition is a big part of our forests in the eastern U.S., northeastern U.S., um, because a lot of our other, these other things are, are less limiting, but all of these are determined by sight. And so what I'm gonna talk about in forest ecology is the importance of sight. So when we think about sight factors, um, we have to think about you know, the climate, the soil, the topography. Those things are gonna determine what trees and plants grow there within a, a larger community and how well they're gonna succeed. Um, in those spaces. So when we think about climate, you know, we're thinking about long periods of time um, and it is measurements of temperature, humidity, precipitation, atmospheric pressure, wind, rainfall, um, atmospheric particles, et cetera, et cetera, um, that are over extended period of times so that set the climate. So we're dealing, climate is, you know, multiple years. Um, weather is usually about a two week window that you consider. And weather is all of all those elements above, but in that short time span and more directly and immediately impacted by things like latitude, terrain, elevation, nearby water bodies, because it's that shorter time frame. Average over a longer time frame, those things play in too, but um, maybe their impact is less immediate. I wasn't sure how many folks were or where everyone in attendance was gonna be here. So I do wanna think about water and the importance of water. Um, and so this is the most current um, 
average of normal precipitation, it dates from 1981 to, or, yeah, 2010, and it is the most current. We expect to see the next, the, mo the more current coming out this year because it'll go from 1991 to 2020. Um, and I would expect to see some changes just seeing how climate changes impacting rainfall patterns, but just kind of, you know, interesting to look at. And you can kind of see um, if we think about, if you've ever looked at a map of forests or consider your state, you know, the majority of forests are in the Eastern US and the Pacific Northwest. And those are areas that have adequate rainfall. Upper Midwest, um, you know, uh, have trees, but you also start thinking about the plains and then you move into the mountains and spaces where these uh, requirements become more limiting. Water, especially, you can see that from this rainfall graph. Um, so some numbers, the yellow, kind of looking at uh, Western Minnesota, it's about 20 to 24 inches. Um, that chart is hard to read. Green, the greens are the 24 to 36 inches. The turquoise colors are 36 to 40, light blue, 40 to 50 inches on average. Dark blue, like down in the um, Gulf Coast, uh, is 60 to 70 inches. The heaviest on average rainfall normal precipitation is up in the Pacific Northwest. That really light purple color is more than 160 inches of rainfall on average. And the darkest red down there in Southern California is less than four inches. So just kind of thinking about how rainfall is occurring and it is influenced by mountains and ocean and, and wind, excuse me, prevailing winds, et cetera, all dictating where we get um, majority precipitation. But you think about the water cycle that's coming in, and, the, and this is a Pennsylvania um, map, and I stole it, but you get water falling. Pennsylvania average is around 40 inches, um, which kind of represents the whole of the mid-Atlantic. Sorry, I'm looking back at my, at my uh, colored uh, map. Um, 40 inches, so rainfall is falling. Half of that is evaporated off of hard surfaces or um, not hard surfaces, off of surfaces into the atmosphere. And the other half is, and the other part of that is transpired by trees. So you have rainfall that comes into the ground, trees take the water up into their roots and they um, exude water vapor as they are respiring, as they're creating the oxygen uh, take it in the CO2. So of the water budget, um, about half um, at a minimum is going back up into the atmosphere through the biological system or through just uh, sunlight, uh, turning it into gas and bringing it back up. The other half is going into the ground where it is also available for uptake. Um, we get Pennsylvania, the average is about seven inches of that 40 is going to runoff and about 13 is going into recharge. But those things all contribute to streams. Um, I'd recently watched a talk uh, from some folks in Maryland and they were averaging 80% uh, of the total precipitation was going back up into the atmosphere through evapotranspiration and soils and um, vegetation have a lot to do with that. So, you know, think about rain falling over the annual, over the year, about half of that rainfall is going back up into the atmosphere. Um, so water, yeah, critical to forest uh, success, tree growth. The next thing we think about is soil. Uh, soil is the medium that supports plant, animal, fungal, bacterial life. It holds nutrients, water, oxygen, and it serves as a point of anchorage for plant roots. Um, it is made up of three different defined types of particles. Uh, clay is the smallest, um, which means, so it's the smallest in and of itself, but that means it has the smallest air spaces between it. So it holds the most nutrients and water because those things bind tightly to the clay particles, but there's not a lot of air when you have a heavy clay uh, soil. Uh, Sand, on the other hand, is the largest particles. Um, it has the most air because the larger particles, as they bump up against each other, you know, they're creating big gaps. Um, it holds the least amount of water and the least amount of nutrients because it's got all those open spaces, those macro pores, um, for lack, for to use the official terminology. Um, silt is kind of in the middle. So the the best, the ideal. Uh, Soil is kind of a loam. It's a mix of all, all three of those particle types. 
Um, and then soils are also broken up into horizons, which you can see on that image to the right, um, the O horizon, the A horizon, B and C. And those have very different characteristics. And, um, but I'm gonna focus just on the O horizon. Um, forest soils have this unique space um, called the O horizon. Um, the only other place it really occurs is in some of the remnant prairies that haven't been disturbed. So it's a very deep um, organic layer and it, um, where forests has, have existed in long, uh, long stretches of time, you know, you really get a lot of, um, a lot of uh, the total soil column being made up by that O horizon. So it's, it's where decomposition happens. It's uh, the leaves and the twigs that fall from the trees. Um, that's a lot of earthworm activity. There's insect activity, there's fungal activity happening there. So lots of biological activity cycling those nutrients. But it has an important role because it's also um, protecting lower layers from, uh, from damage from rainfall. Um, it has a lot of macropores, big openings, so water is moving through. Um, and is really important uh, to tree growth. Uh, so we talk a lot, we think about forest soils and how important they are. So the O horizon is important. Soil plays a role in tree height because of the availability of nutrients and water and oxygen within that space. So on the left, we have sand, which has very low amounts of moisture because water moves very quickly through the system. Lots of air because of those big openings between the particles, which means things are gonna be a little stunted. There's a limiting factor of moisture, of rainfall um, in, for those trees that are growing in that soil type. The other end on the right-hand side, we've got clay, which has a lot of moisture, but not a lot of oxygen. And again, we start to see stunted growth because while rainfall is in abundance, that oxygen that the roots need to complete photosynthesis um, and, up, and nutrient uptake is just not allowing that growth to occur. So, so, you, so soil texture does significantly influence the ability of the trees to grow because it, it limits water uptake, it limits nutrient uptake depending upon what's available within it. If you've never looked to see what your soils are, there are some great resources out there um, that would kind of give you insight into how trees and plants are growing on your land or in your area. Um, USDA has a web soil survey. It's kind of the oldest that's been around for a while. Uh, used to be in big books that you go to the conservation district and look up, you'd look up your location and figure out what your soils were. Now, of course, with everything, it's on the web. Um, the California Soil Resources Lab is another one. Uh, while it's based at UC Davis, it does cover the whole of the US. It is a Google, ma Google Maps based platform, so it is kind of intuitive. But what it, what it tells you is you go to your location, it tells you the soils that are there, and then there's information about those soils. You know, do they have high sand content? Do they have high clay content? Are they erodible? Um, this is, these are highly, um, uh, arable lands good for growing crops, or these are less uh, arable lands that maybe trees are the best use. So it's a really interesting thing to uncover if you haven't done that yet. Um, so the next thing about site that influences tree growth is topography. So the steeper the slope, um, you know, that's, you're going to see more nutrient loss, more water runoff, more erosion. You're going to see shallower soil because of that erosion potential. Um, so in places where you have steep slope, uh, you start to see it impacting how soils are deposited on there. So where at the top of a slope, you have pretty shallow soils because things are, things are moving. Things are moving downhill, eroding. Um, mid slope, you tend to get a little bit deeper soils. And at the bottom, where things have built up over the years, you have pretty deep soils, which impacts tree height and tree, how well trees are going to grow. So, um, you know, that, that soil depth is uh, directly related to uh, tree height and tree growth. And as well as we'll get to um, in a little bit, specific species that are able to um, tolerate those uh, conditions. The other thing you think about is slope shape. So um, I always have to, I always have to do my hands. Um, 
So convex places in a slope where the, the slope is dipping in, making the convex. Um, no, sorry, I did that backwards, right? <laughs> convex is pointing out. Um, apologies, brain. Okay, convex usually tend to be more drier sites because it's bulging out, which means it's gonna be a little more erodible. Um, lower in nutrients, things are moving downhill, uh, reduced soil vol volume uh, because of that increased erosion. Concave, where it does bow in, and apologies for that, uh, you see soil buildup. So that the trees, the soil tends to be moister, it's richer, um, there's less erosion because things have built up over time because erosion forces aren't uh, as great. Um, the other thing we think about within topography is aspect. So what direction the slope is facing, because that will influence the thing that things that limit limit tree growth. Light, which is directly tied to heat, uh, wind, which causes evaporation of and, and availability of water. And so if you think about um, the importance of the light and heat with regard to aspect. Um, this is a, a graph roughly illustrating different facing slopes and when the sun hits them um, on the longest day of the year. So the, um, the, the summer, nope, I'm just summer solstice. Yes, thank you. Um, so early in the morning, east facing slopes, because the sun rises in the east, are going to get the most sun. Um, and then fade off as the sun moves to the west. Uh, north facing slopes are, are gonna be, uh, well, let me back up. Because we're in North America, the sun and not very close to the equator, the sun is always to the south of overhead. Um, it's always gonna be to, to rising and setting to the south of us. Um, and so even on the longest day of the year when the sun is most directly overhead, it's still off to the south. So north facing slopes are gonna get uh, gentler sun conditions over a longer period of time. South facing slopes get the heat of the day, um, hot, constant, and western facing slopes tend to get hotter later in the day just as the sun moves. But what we see in terms of um, light and heat impacting sites are the south and western slopes um, tend to be drier because of the heat, because of the light, which again translates to how well a tree grows. You tend to get your tallest trees of the same species on north facing slopes. It's a kinder, gentler place. Um, eastern facing slopes are uh, also kind and gentle, south facing slopes, less kind, not at all kind and gentle west, um, uh, kind of between south and east, just because of how light is moving in the space. So you think about all these things, how they all come together in terms of how well a tree is going to grow um, in a space, which takes us to this idea of tolerance. Um, so trees can tolerate a, a wide amplitude of condition, but they do better in certain conditions. So um, if, if, if water is not limiting, if space is not limiting, if nutrients are not limiting, you know, trees can go full bore as long as those other things don't become limiting. Um, but that's not always the case, that those other things become limiting factors. And so that determines um, how well a tree will do that, that amplitude of tolerance. So when we think about uh, site um, and we think about the trees that occur on that site, we have to think about their tolerance for shade, the absence of light. And so we as foresters kind of define this by the absence of light. Um, and there are three kind of categories of trees that, that are gonna, based on all those site conditions, this tolerance is gonna kind of help determine what grows in those spaces. So shade intolerant, don't like any shade. Intermediate, yeah, I can handle shade, a little bit of shade, I can handle a little bit of sun. Um, and then shade tolerant, meaning yeah, I can hang on in understory or don't need a ton of light 
to, to regenerate and grow. Slower growing, but um, I can do it. So some of the shade intolerance. So these are the ones that need nearly full sunlight to germinate and grow. You know, you think about the trees that occur early in a site uh, succession, and um, Laura's going to go into that a bit more. But these are kind of the they call them the pioneer species or um, early successional species because they need that full sunlight to germinate and grow. Things like aspen and black cherry. Yellow poplar uh, is a very fast growing uh, site, a uh, tree that does well. It can also eventually ends up in more shaded conditions once it's a mature tree. But yeah, to, to get a baby tree started, you're kind of looking at full sunlight to get established. Ash, uh, white ash and birches uh, tend to fall in this shade intolerant um, range. You think about your intermediate species, and these are, you know, 50% sunlight, half the sky uh, open for them. Uh, the oaks fall in this category, the hickories fall in this category, and interestingly, white pine. Uh, many more of our evergreens tend to be more shade intolerant, but white pine can kind of tolerate that 50% sunlight range. And then the shade tolerant species, you know, these are the ones that um, we think of in long-term undisturbed forests of kind of the northern part of the U.S. Um, beech forests, sugar maples, the hemlocks that um, we're watching fall out. But these trees can handle low light conditions. They have structures that they're able to photosynthesize enough light in lower light densities to stay alive. Um, and so when you think about, um, when you look at a forest around you and you think about the species that you have, you have to think about their tolerances for light, excuse me, but because that will kind of give you an idea of his, history a little bit, but also what you're likely to have happen next in the long term cycle. So when we think about this um, principles of forest that trees require all these different conditions, it's a wide amplitude, but they're going to be places where they do best and all of these things go into into that. Um, I, I have a question for you, and I think looking at my time, maybe it's best to put it in the chat if you're willing. So in your mind, I want you to locate your favorite tree that was not planted. <laughs> so if someone could, um, if you were willing to type in the chat, uh, what, what your favorite not planted tree in its natural condition and kind of describe it. Um, and I'll give it just a minute to, if, anybody, if people are willing to type in. And Allison wants people type it in. I'm happy to read it out loud as well. Okay. I, I opened the chat so I could see it too. I don't know if okay. it's covering up my slides. It's not. I can see your okay. slide perfectly. Okay. So Wendy Scribner's Sugar Maple at the base of a hill. Wendy, do you know what direction your, your hill is facing? Sierra, I don't know California live oaks. I so west facing slope, but at the base of a hill. So a sugar maple tends to be more music, um, likes those moisture conditions. It does well in low shade. Um, so it, yeah, it's the base of the hill is kind of the key piece there. Uh, red oak pasture grown, now deep forest. Um, ooh, people are typing, I gotta make it bigger. <laughs> Uh, now deep forest. Uh, so red oak can tolerate that amplitude of, of, of sunlight. At 50% it does best, but it's got some range. So red oak can, can hold on in those highlight conditions. Someone talked about a lone wolf tree that were in woods that used to be pasture land. Um, maple being a tree that can hang on in low light conditions. Um, beach throughout my oak pine forest. Uh, beach coming in underneath the oak pine most likely because it can uh, regenerate in those lower light conditions. White oak is always an interesting one for me. Elizabeth Green mentioned a white oak on a south facing slope. White oak has a really wide range of um, tolerances for things like dry soils uh, to, to more moist soils. And so you see white oak in very rich sites, but you also can see it kind of hanging on in places where you're like, I wouldn't have expected this this high on the mountain or on a south facing slope. So um, 
thank you all for being willing to do that. Uh, it's it's fun to see everybody's favorite trees, but but when you think about um, how trees are growing and where your favorite tree is, what that all describes is what we call the silvix of a tree, and this is that idea of preferences uh, for this for for soils. Do they like acidic soils or alkaline soils? Uh, moisture? Can they tolerate drought, or do they need? Um, more moist soils, light, you know, do they need full sunlight? Do they need 50% sunlight? Can they tolerate low shade? Um, and climate being kind of overall conditions of um, a wind and uh, pressures, of atmospheric pressures kind of thing. Um, so when you think about that, you think about silvix. So all of that forest ecology pieces all feed into this idea of silvix, with it, which is this idea of preferences. Which some people then ask, you know, how do you determine the right plant for the right site? And uh, you kind of look for similar conditions, maybe places that are undisturbed to get a sense of what should be there um, and hope that that's there. There are also range maps and um, there are some great resources called the um, Silvix of North American Trees put up by the Forest Service. There's two volumes that um, one is for evergreens and one is for um, hardwoods. And they're great resources. They talk about when trees are, are, flower, are flowering and how they get pollinated and how their seed disperses and site characteristics that they need. And when I think about silics, I'm just, I'm just throwing up these two examples. Um, I grew up in the Southern US and spent a lot of time in Southeastern US. And so I identify uh, red cedar with karst topography. So where there are a lot of caves, if you drive through uh, Virginia and you are driving through the Shenandoah Valley and you see all the signs for the caverns, if you look at the trees, you see all these uh, cedar, red cedars growing in that area. And it, those two just go hand in hand to me. Um, and then the other one is this picture of big tulip poplar, which in a hollow, in a, in a very mesic, a very good condition site where they are getting really big. And I think about, um, visiting the Smoky Mountains and when I was in school and going to the Joyce, Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest with the old growth uh, yellow poplar and, and the site conditions that were there. Um, because of how trees grow and because of how all these things are, are impacting tree growth, you see that trees, even of the same species and the same age may not have the same size because we're dealing with ideas of competition, whoops. So both of these uh, cookie, tree cookies are of a tree that is 70 years old. And you can see Gary, Gil Gary San Julian there kind of showing um, the little tree that was probably on a poorer site or um, had to compete for those needed pieces, those needed resources to thrive as compared to this bigger tree cookie that probably had no limiting factors. And so that um, takes us into, I'm about to hand off to Laura, but um, all of, so we've got all the um, site conditions that are determining tree growth. And now we introduce this idea of competition because trees compete with each other for light and nutrients and water and space. Um, and so that also determines how well things are gonna grow, how trees are gonna grow and get established. If they're a fully closed canopy, you're not gonna have um, oaks get well established in understory to grow up and be the next tree um, because they need more light. This is a picture of a of a um, a canopy looking up, and you can these two trees, the round one here and this one here, are red oaks. Um, and then over here, down below, we got a red maple that we can tell is competing with this oak because the oaks. Um, crown is a straight line, which means the two, the branches are bumping up against each other and uh, the red maple is beating, is breaking the oak uh, branches, giving it a more straight crown. And so we see that competition playing out in how well trees get to the upper, the overstory, the dominant position in the overstory. Um, the co-dominant are the ones that are kind of up there, but they've got some competition on the sides. Intermediate trees just get the eyes, just get light from above, and the suppressed trees. Maybe there's some trees that can tolerate low light conditions in that understory layer, but 
but often their um, that competition may make them such slow growers that um, it's difficult it's hard for them to get up into the overstory when allowed so I'm hoping that what I just did set us up well for understanding the next piece about succession. So what I wanted to cover was really how, how to help you think about what your site is, how that influences how trees grow, um, and uh, recognize that there's a lot of variation and there's a lot of amplitude, but there's a lot to kind of understand foundationally to why forests are where they are and how they come to be there and how they day, how they succeed. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Great. Thank you so much, Allison. And if anybody has any questions for Allison or for Laura, feel free to type them in the chat box now if you want, and I can snag them and I'll we'll ask them later and we can have a discussion. Um, but Laura, if, whenever you're ready to share your presentation, I'll just read your bio while you get ready for that. So Laura is a research forester with the US Forest Service, Northern Research Station, and faculty associate at University of Maine. She has more than 20 years experience studying forest ecology and management in Northern forests of New England and the Lake States. She's a, she is an author or a co-author of more than 100 scientific publications, wow, <laughs> including a widely used textbook. Laura is committed to supporting women in forestry and is a recipient of the Forest Services Inspiring Women Leadership Award. So I'm pretty happy that we have Laura here today to talk to us about forest succession and stand dynamics. So Laura, take it away. Hey, thank you, Dakota. Can everyone see my um, slides on the screen? Okay, yes. excellent. So um, I want to start out by um, acknowledging um, Allison and thanking her for her help in pulling together the presentation that I'm going to share with you today. And what we're going to talk about in the next 25 minutes or so is um, how and why forests change. And I think this is really fundamental to understanding what's happening in our forests. Um, how they got to be the way they are and what we can expect from them in the future. So I think it's pretty obvious. Um, all of us know that change happens in all areas of our life. And this is certainly true about forests. And some of these changes are more obvious than others. One forest change that I think um, most of you have observed is the change from an agricultural field to a forest following farm abandonment. And this is something that's been quite common in the forests of New England, particularly Southern New England, because we have such a, a long history of agriculture. So this is a nice example of a, um, trajectory of change in forest that has touched most of our lives. So the process that's happening here is succession. And succession is the natural progression from one predominant vegetation type to another over time in the absence of a disturbance that would come in and mess up that um, linear pathway. And I'll talk about that a little bit shortly. But in short, we would start with an early or pioneer community where you would have grasses or forbs that are predominant. Over time, you'll start to see more mixed herbaceous vegetation and we're entering a transitional stage of succession. This would give way to shrubs and ultimately to trees and that would be considered late succession. So those four stages represent um, different mechanisms within the community that are related to availability of resources, including light and soil moisture, and as well as the competition between the vegetation that's there. So we start out with the herbaceous opening, the ground covered with grasses. Then we go to the shrubs and seedlings what foresters would call a sapling or pole stand comes next. So that's dominated by small to mid-sized trees and then a mature stand so that's fully grown. And I'm talking about it this way um, from a forest perspective because this really supports the conversation we're gonna have today. And foresters call the types of stands that would result from this process even age stands because 
all the trees are pretty close to the same age. We generally would say within 20 years or so. It came up about the same time. So there are a lot of implications for succession in terms of not only what your forest looks like and what you can expect to happen next, but the other values that it provides. And one that is of particular interest to many landowners is wildlife. And so this schematic shows us on the left, a very early successional community over time, moving on the right to a mature forest community. And there's a lot of information here, but I just wanted to key in on a few important points. And that is out here in the early successional herbaceous opening stage, we're gonna have the types of animals that really require um, a kind of low brushy sunlit environment. So you would see grasshoppers, sparrows, have some wild turkeys. As your forest develops over time, if it is coming from potentially an old field situation, you will see changes in forest structure going into this dense stand of young trees, which are gonna grow bigger over time and then start to have some old trees with deadwood. And so we see a shift in the types of wildlife that can be supported. So here in the middle of the successional trajectory, we see we pick up some chestnut bided warblers and then we move on further. And then out here in the mature stage, you're more likely to see pileated woodpeckers that would excavate on large trees that have deadwood. Flying squirrels might be in a forest like that. So there's a lot of resources available to landowners online if you just search around about the different wildlife that use your forest. And understanding where your forest is in this successional trajectory can help you understand the types of wildlife that you might see. There are some challenges. So I mentioned earlier that um, succession happens in the absence of other disturbances. Now, in fact, when scientists originally came up with the idea of succession, they thought that every natural community had one specific dynamic that it followed. So it was very predictable and it was linear and it would result in what's called a climax or late successional stable condition. We now know that is not how it works most of the time. There's so many external factors that affect our forest that it can change that directory so it doesn't look like the way it does in textbooks. And in fact, I recently looked up succession in a forest ecology textbook and there was like three chapters on it. So it's a very complicated topic. Some of the things that can affect succession, particularly when we're thinking about folks coming in, um, plants coming in in an open um, forest condition are what we would call recalcitrant herbaceous layers. So you might get some really dense understory vegetation, so that's trees below the main canopy, that use up all the space and just aren't allowing other trees to come on the site. Additionally, sometimes plants are particularly competitive. This can happen both with native plants and with non-native invasive plants, and this can prevent other species from colonizing the site or developing as well. And here is a photograph of a a uh, conifer dominated stand here in Maine that has very abundant glossy buckthorn, a non-native invasive in the understory. And because of that, it has taken over the site and changed the development that we would expect here. And then finally, herbivores can have a great impact on the forest community, particularly in Southern New England, down in Pennsylvania, there's places where there's so much browsing that the plants that would normally grow on a site aren't there because those animals are selective in what they eat. So white-tailed deer, I mentioned the effects of browsing. Deer are highly selective in what they choose to eat. So in the winter, they're looking for um, plants that are more nutritive and available, such as northern white cedar is a critical winter browse for white-tailed deer. During other parts of the year, when the foliage is greened up, they have a much broader diet. You might see um, stumps like the one shown here that start to sprout and the deer just have eaten all of those off. So we have observed for some species in some parts of the country that you simply cannot regenerate 
and grow small trees up to large tree size if there are high populations of deer. And this is a huge you know, socioeconomic political issue where our management of forests and our management of wildlife and what people wanna see have all come together in a very controversial way. The bottom line is that if you're on your woodland, it's worth it to look around and see some of the small trees. Do the um, little branches look like the picture shown here in the middle? That shows that deer have ripped off part of that and indicates that they are having effect on your forest. Hair browsing is another important impact in some areas. And I will admit to you that until about 10 years ago, when I really started looking closely at this, I didn't appreciate the degree to which hair can influence the composition of our um, forest community. So here is a snowshoe hair on the left. And here on the right is a red spruce tree um, here in Maine, where I am located. That tree is at least 20 years old, easily, possibly older. And what has happened is that the hair have browsed on it so much that it's a very sad looking little bonsai tree. And if you're looking in your forest and see some of this, that might indicate that you have some hair browsing and the hair will bite the branches off. It looks like they're clipped clean at an angle instead of tearing like the deer do. So that's kind of a fun thing to look for. A word that I think has probably crept into my presentation so far is um, stand. And I wanna define that now because this is a concept that foresters use and it refers to an area of the forest in which trees or other vegetation is sufficiently similar in its composition, its age, its size, its spatial arrangement to be distinguished from adjoining areas. This is a photograph that I really like. Um, this was taken with a drone and it shows on the right a forest that is dominated by um, hardwood species. So we see from the fall color that those leaves are starting to change in mixture with some softwoods. And on the left, almost pure um, softwoods or conifers, evergreen trees, white pine, balsam fir, red spruce, while we have more birches, aspens, and red maple on the right side. And so I don't need to tell you where the two stands are in this picture. We can see this. And this is so obvious because this is the result of management that went on differently in these two places with the boundary line in between. Often these distinctions are, are not this clear in the forest. You might see some along property lines, but there are natural stand boundaries where maybe there are differences in the slope or the soil condition, as Allison mentioned, that would cause you to have different compositions and structures. And so taking a look around your forest and thinking like, hmm, how does this differ from that other area I was in? And why is it different? And how did it get to be that way? And what does it mean for the future? Those are all really interesting things to ponder. So there are a number of forces that shape forests. These include here in our region, I already mentioned agriculture. There has been widespread land clearing and abandonment. And then those lands started coming back to forests. Logging, here in New England, harvesting has been going on um, back to the 1700s at a pretty, um, at a pretty heavy rate. So that has affected a lot of our forest land, even if it hasn't been cleared for agriculture. Weather events. Um, so I'm thinking storms, ice storms, hurricanes, there's even the occasional tornado. Those things in our region are important. Um, fire is also a factor that shapes forests, as well as animals. We talked about the browsing insects and disease. So I have two photographs here that show some nice forest um, change mechanisms. The first is a beaver meadow on the upper peninsula of Michigan. And there's actually a little story behind this, which I will share. This used to be a northern white cedar stand. And I'm doing research on northern white cedar. And I had a map from the 1980s. And I went out to find this stand. And instead of the stand, I found this area that was completely flooded with water with most of the trees dead. And so I went around the back of it to try to find the rest of the stand. And then I got stuck and couldn't come back and I had to walk through and the water was like up to my waist. So a really good example of how um, animals can really change a forest community 
and um, move it off the successional trajectory that it was on. On the bottom, we have a picture of a prescribed fire. This was done to um, reduce slash or fuels in the forest after a harvest. It also kills a small vegetation and can result in different vegetation being present. And this is a tool that's used on some national forest lands here in the East to um, maintain wildlife openings. It's also used to regenerate oak and for some other purposes. So these are some of the things either naturally or because of our actions that shape forests. So I have a poll question. I'm hoping this works. I don't know if I'm gonna see it because, oh, there it is, I do see it. Okay, so my question for you all is, which of these forest disturbances, and I have a little list here, have you seen the most in the woods? And it says, choose your top three. So I'm gonna let that roll for a minute or so here. Okay, so I think, keep answering for sure, but I think we're starting to see some trends develop here. And that is that the most prevalent disturbance that folks have seen are trees that are blown over by the wind. Like nine out of 10 of you have seen that. And then next we have trees bent or broken by ice, logging, um, and foliage killed by insects, reasonably similar in terms of their prevalence. And then fire, is at a very low level. Now, I think, let me see if I can make that go away off my screen. I think that makes a lot of sense because when we think about the natural disturbances in our region, we primarily have small scale wind events. Fire as a stand replacing event, that means one that kills a whole stand, has a return interval up here in New England where I am of something like a thousand years. It's very rare. Now that's not true. I know we have some folks today down from more Southern parts of the country. Their fire, though admittedly often set by humans, is much more common. So depending on the part of the um, country that you are in, there's different climatic forces, there's different forest um, compositions, and that can result in different natural disturbances. So the stand replacing disturbances, that these are disturbances that would kill a whole forest so that it kind of starts over from small trees, include severe fire. So I just talked about that, not super common in the Northeast. I do have a picture on the top right here, which was from a 1940s fire in Southern Maine that burned a lot of the state. And it caused a lot of um, mortality of large trees it burned up whole towns. You see there's like old pictures from newspapers of people sitting outside with their belongings on the curb. It was a very traumatic event for people in the state. So that is not common up in the part of the country where I am from. Strong hurricanes can also kill a whole stand. And by this, I mean the really rare event. So the picture I have on the bottom left here from the Forest History Society is from the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And that was the, what's called the Great New England Hurricane in 1938. And it's called the Great New England Hurricane to this day because we still remember how severe it was. At the time, that hurricane had the highest forward wind speed of any that had come onto the northeastern shore. And it was called the Long Island Express because it came in through Long Island. Um, we have lately had some very severe hurricanes that have had similar um, negative effects but they're not the predominant factors in our forests. And then harvesting, clear cutting, shown on the bottom right, can remove all the trees from the forest or clearing for agriculture. So that is the suite of disturbances that would make a forest start all over. And we saw from the replies that you gave to the poll question, that's not what we're seeing the most. What we're seeing the most in our natural forest is, is these wind events. So let's take a minute and talk about this process of stand development after you've had a stand replacing disturbance. And succession really happens when you have all the vegetation removed from the site. And often with a stand replacing disturbance that's starting from a forest condition rather than a field condition, you might already have small trees or you'd have a seed source nearby. And so that development we would 
talk about in terms of stand development rather than strictly succession. So we start with the stand initiation phase and that just means it's getting started and there are small trees. Next, we have what's known as the stem exclusion stage. And this means that the stems that are growing there are big enough that they're excluding any others from getting started. So this tends to have mid-sized trees, uh, one single canopy, be it low or high, and really nothing growing underneath. You've all probably walked through a forest like this. And this is a forest that could provide good habitat for white-tailed deer in the winter, where they really wanna have um, protection from a deep snow in the wind. If we think of our forest developing further, the next stage naturally that would occur is called the understory reinitiation phase. And of course, the understory refers to the small plants and trees that are growing beneath the larger canopy. And here, those natural disturbance dynamics have started to come into play. So you might have um, a single tree die because it was rotten or it got old or one or a few trees get blown down by wind. And this allows some light uh, to reach the understory. It frees up resources and some other small plants or trees can start to grow. And then finally, if we haven't um, come into this stand and either done logging or clearing or had a stand replacing disturbance naturally of the type I mentioned, we'll reach a stage that's known as the complex stage. This also um, can, after a very long time, be called the old growth stage. And so here you have old trees and middle-aged trees and young trees, and you have trees that have died and fallen over. And so this is a stand that's had the opportunity for individual trees to live out their lives and have small disturbances. So I have a really fun series of photos here and we um, need to thank Allison for making these available to me. They were in fact taken by the US Forest Service um, in Pennsylvania on the Arno Forest in Allegheny Hardwoods. And so here is a photo of a forest stand in 1927. And this picture was taken after a saw log harvest. That means they went in and they took all the large trees to sell. And that's not actually a very sustainable approach to forestry, but for our purposes, um, it shows the stand condition today. Well, they followed up after that with what was called at that time, a chemical wood harvest. And they cut basically all the trees. So all that's left is small trees and a few scattered ones. And we see that here in this photograph. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna click through over time and see how this forest developed and that those phases of stand development that we talked about. So here's after 10 years, we see a young stand with what we call natural regeneration. That's what foresters call when the trees come on their own. If you plant it, it's called artificial regeneration. So here's 10 years. 20 years, now it's starting to look more like what we think of a forest being. 30 years, we see the trees are getting larger and notably some of the trees are larger than others. That is related to the species of the tree. Some grow faster than others. Those that are less tolerant of shade, as Allison mentioned in more early succession, will grow more rapidly. Were those more tolerant of shade, have more of a conservative growth response. So they're kind of coming along slowly. There's also competition between them. So some are getting bigger and others are getting into those suppressed positions she mentioned and starting to be small. So further stand development and like differentiation of different size trees. Now this looks like a forest, right? 40 years after it had all been cut. And I wanna draw your attention to um, this tree right here in the red box. So keep your eye on it. Okay, so here we are 10 years after that previous photo and we see now that tree has died and has broken. That was an aspen tree, which was shorter lived than some of the other species here in the stand. So next 10 years again after that, it's 60 years. We see that aspen tree is now what we call a snag or a dead standing tree, which would be used by wildlife, woodpeckers and ants and other species. And we see again, this further differentiation of trees into some large ones growing well and some not so well. 
And here, take a look at this um, sprout of maple and look particularly at the stem on the right in that box I've highlighted. So that's year 70, but year 80, that stem has died. And so that was a tree that got outcompeted by the one next to it. And then 90 years, here we are, we see that that um, now dead stem has fallen on the ground and decayed and it's not there anymore. So if you looked at this forest now at 90 years old, you wouldn't necessarily know that this started from a stand that had been completely harvested close to a century before. This is an even age stand, as I mentioned, where all the trees started at kind of the same time. And the aesthetics of this are pretty indicative of what those look like. So see, there aren't a lot of trees in understory. There are some that are starting to come in that are those shade tolerant species that Allison told us about, but mostly the trees are, are um, have a single high canopy, we call it. So these are good stands to walk around in. And again, there's that one tree that lost its partner that died. So um, I want to shift for a minute and talk a little bit more about those partial disturbances that affect how stands develop or what we call stand dynamics. And these are also called less than stand replacing disturbances. And these kill or remove some of the trees in a stand. And so this could include harvesting, surface fire, insects, and wind. Now, harvesting I talked about can be a stand replacing disturbance, but more often in our region, we harvest some of the trees and not all. And so there's a picture of that on the right hand side that's a mechanized harvesting operation where machines are going into the woods to remove the trees. Fire that kills a whole stand would be a crown fire that got up into the foliage of the trees. Surface fire house burns along the ground can kill the vegetation there and so change what's happening in the future. But if the trees have thick bark, eastern white pine, for example, can tolerate a surface fire, they won't be affected by that. So this is then a partial disturbance. Insects and wind are also factors. So insects typically will affect um, one species or individual trees. So gypsy moth, for example, would really focus on some species of oak and could cause um, mortality of many trees of the same species across an area. While on the other hand, the hemlock woolly adelgid in the middle and the balsam woolly adelgid on the right tend to kill individual trees. So they will affect a whole species, but some trees are more susceptible than others. Maybe they're not as vigorous, they're more suppressed, they will succumb more easily to the effects of the insect. So in that way, you can have a partial disturbance. And some of these insects are um, non-native invasive, but some of the insects in our forests are um, native. The Eastern spruce budworm, for example, is a native species here in Northern New England that affects spruce trees. And so you often see this type of mortality in your forest um, on a continuing basis. Wind is another factor, and this is the one that came up the most um, in our poll, and I'm not at all surprised by that because that is our prevailing natural disturbance regime up here. So you could have trees that are blown down, such on the left, this could be one or a few trees creating a small opening in the canopy. Trees can also break off from wind if they were rotten inside. Now, what does this do for stand development? We talked about these stages earlier and it's pretty straightforward from an even aged perspective. But I mentioned right at the start that things don't usually work out the way that we thought they were gonna when you think linearly. And so what if we just had a whole forest that was in the understory reinitiation phase? So you have your large trees and then some few little gaps where trees are starting to grow. There's then a disturbance that is partial. So it doesn't kill the whole forest, it just removes some trees. And this could happening, this could be happening from a windrow event, it could happen from harvesting. I'm going to go with harvesting for this one because the way that I whited those out, it looks like little stumps. So those trees are now gone. And so what has happened is a part of your forest is now back in the stand initiation stage. And then that will start to develop on its own into the stem exclusion phase, 
ultimately the understory reinitiation phase. And in that way, different pockets of your forest are at different stages of development. And foresters call this an uneven age stand because different trees got started growing at different times. So I'm gonna wrap things up here with just a brief review of some of the things that you can look at in your forest to give you a better idea of what the past influences might have been. And these are related to the site itself, the vegetation that is there, any artifacts and history that you might have. So the most obvious um, is something that was built in your forest. And so here is a photograph of an old cellar hole where the foundation was made out of stone. And so this is where there was a homestead at some point many years ago, which is now gone, but we still see the remnants of that in the forest. And this tells us that this area was likely cleared. Similarly, it's not uncommon to find apple trees in forests in New England. And in fact, the forest that I walk my dog on every day has apple trees at intervals spread throughout the rest of the stand. And they're kind of sad and half dead now, so they don't really jump out at you like this beautiful specimen. But that tells me that that was an orchard at one point. And so seeing those clues can help us to understand how what we have now got to be that way. Stone walls, another very obvious sign of past use for agriculture, and these could be stacked or thrown. There's all different types of stone walls. There's whole books about stone walls. Similarly, barbed wire tells us that this was a pasture land. And you have an idea of how big the trees were at that time because we see the tree has fully overgrown the wire. Plow furrows are another indication of agriculture. So in this case, that means that where this young forest is was previously a field because we see the lines from where the plow had gone on that. And then we had earlier in Allison's question about um, the trees that we like and where we've seen him of what's called wolf trees or pasture trees. So here's a hardwood on the left, uh, eastern white pine on the right. These trees are often left in pastures when the land is cleared for agriculture because they provide shade. When these are abandoned and revert to forest, we'll find these great big trees with spreading branches. That is a sign they grew in the open in a forest of younger trees that are more densely grown. Stumps also have great clues for us. Obviously, a freshly cut stump tells us that some harvesting happened here. Over time, as seen on the right, these become highly decayed and start to look more like the forest and they provide wonderful regeneration microsites for certain plants, including some of our tree species, eastern hemlock, yellow birch, red maple, or not red maple, um, red spruce, pardon me, all um, can be found on either stumps or where stumps have tipped over, trees have tipped over and, and unearthed some fresh soil. Sometimes the stumps are gone, but we'll see sprouts of trees that originated from a stump. So here on the bottom is red maple. That is a prolific stump sprouter. Cut a red maple, grows a whole bunch of new sprouts as long as it still is a vigorous tree. Sometimes really old trees don't do it. And if you keep cutting them, they keep growing more sprouts. And this is why we're getting more and more red maple um, here in the Northeast over the years because of our history of logging. So here we can't see the stumps, but we know that those originated from harvesting. Sometimes you see a really old stump and you wonder, does that mean that this was harvested or did a tree break off? We saw earlier that that can happen from the wind. And the best clue there is to look and see if you can see a fallen log on the forest floor. These might be highly decayed. This one's all covered with moss and plants. Sometimes they even just look like kind of a little bump if it's a line. The fact that there's a stump there with what was a log next to it tells us that this wasn't harvested, that tree fell over and is still there. And then finally, I think this is my last sign of what a harvested stand might look like. You might sometimes find these convenient walking trails in the woods where the ground is sort of smoother and seems to follow a line. It might be a little compacted and those are often from skid trails where the logs were pulled out back in the day when harvesting was done or recently when harvesting was done. So I have another poll question before we wrap it up. So if um, Leonora could put that up. 
which is your favorite, um, which type of forest is your favorite? So if you were gonna pick one, do you like one that has big trees mostly, small and big trees mixed up together, or mostly small trees? So I'll let that run for a minute. Okay, so I, I think, keep putting in your answers, but I think um, we're seeing a trend here. And that is that the majority of participants today um, like a forest that has large and small trees mixed together, but a good number, more than a quarter, like forests that have large trees and a, a very few like those that have small trees. And sometimes folks that are interested in seeing certain types of wildlife or in hunting will like those very open forests with small trees. Well, the reason why I wanted to ask that is um, I'm gonna, Hold on, there we go. So as you think about forests that you own or that you visit or forests in general, it's helpful to think about what we learned today about succession and stand dynamics and forest change when we think not only about what those forests are like now, but what we expect them to be in the future. And if they're different than what we would like them to be, what steps might we take to achieve our objectives? So those of you who own forests and have an interest in active forest management, and not everyone does, which is completely fine. If you want a condition in your forest that is different than the stage of development that you have, for instance, if you wanted some area with small trees or a wildlife opening, we think about the natural disturbances that would cause those things, and then whether it would be possible to use forest management, so harvesting, to create some similar conditions in the forest. And this is really the foundation of sustainable forestry, understanding how the forest got to be the way it is, where it's going, and how we can maybe steer that change in a different way. So I hope that was all I had. Um, and this actually is a stump with real decay in that. Nobody did it on purpose. That's a cedar stump that is decayed. And after it was cut off, you could see the smiley face. That's one of my favorite pictures. So thank you all so much for your attention. And I hope that that was useful. And Dakota, I'm turning it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. That was a great presentation and yours too, Allison. I, I definitely learned a couple of things. Most of my training's been in the South. So seeing some New England examples was really fun. Um, so we have about 15 minutes for questions. If folks have any, feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, and I think we have about 50 people. So I do want to say if there's any discussion, if you actually want to ask your question out loud, like if you have to explain it, um, feel free to just unmute yourself or raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, but yeah, we have 15 minutes to ask questions. So if anyone wants to start us off, um, you have the floor. A lot of talk in the chat box about just how great the presentations were and the series of pictures too about the showing the decade by decade was really great. I want to add about that and this is a really nice actually piece of information. Allison told me yesterday, I didn't know this, that those photos in recent years were coordinated by Susan Stout, who's a retired um, scientist with the U.S. Forest Service and she was you know, one of the early women that came in really had a leadership role in forestry in that region and was a wonderful mentor to me. And so it's really exciting that we got to share some photos that she was instrumental in making available for us. Very cool. And Brian asked, does the old growth black cherry stand still exist on the Allegheny National Forest? Are you probably have better insight in that than I do. To my knowledge, it does, unless you've heard otherwise, Allison. I haven't, but they are having a major outbreak of um, a moth that's really impacting it right now. So regeneration of black cherry up there is proving very problematic. Mm -hmm. It looks like Sierra. Yeah, you're raising your hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm down in Virginia and um, the forest that we have is like 
it's mostly like Western facing, it's like slightly Northwestern facing and it was logged at one point. And so a lot of pines have come up and I'm definitely, we're definitely looking to like forest farm in the future. Um, is there any way, cause I feel like by cutting down the pines, it's still just so open um, that it seems like pines would just kind of reestablish themselves. Is that true? Is there any way to direct hardwoods to start growing in that area instead? Um, that's a hard one to say. Uh, I think it really, um, it kind of depends on um, where, where seed sources, what's available. If you have hardwoods established underneath, you know, they can, you can do things to help them hold the site. If no regeneration is established under the pine trees and you do something, you're likely going to get pine trees back because they'll blow in seed. Um, so that, you know, those, what's there now will influence what comes in next. Laura, I see you nodding, so. <laughs> and no, I'm agreeing with what Allison is saying. I mean, certainly there's, if, if you really, if you're trying to move away from the pine, there are some things you can do. Um, for instance, you know, if you were harvesting in a really abundant seed year, that would help the pine to grow more than if you did some harvesting when there weren't abundant seed. You could also think about, um, what we would call enrichment planting, um, where you might want to plant some hardwoods. You know, that's a fairly intensive um, thing to do, but it can be done to um, sort of restore species composition on sites that um, aren't currently what you'd like them to be. So yeah, I'm not seeing it off the top of my head. I agree with what Allison said and would just add those other comments. Thank you. Great, yeah, thank you both. Um, and I saw a question come in from Alan first and then Roberta, I'll get you next. Um, but Alan asked any comments about the impacts of invasives like Norway maples and they might have on a forest stand? Um, well, and I'll, I'll let Allison talk about this as well, but yeah, Norway maple um, and just, you know, other invasives that we have that are shrubs, so Japanese barberry, um, there's the vine oriental bittersweet, um, depending on where you are and how disturbed the site can be, can be quite um, pervasive and can have really an important effect on species composition and the integrity of the natural ecosystem. And um, up where I am, I'm close to commercial forest land, um, an area where there's not a lot of development, just like 8 million acres of forest. They're not as pervasive. But you get into southern New England, um, other parts of the East Coast, particularly where there's been a lot of agriculture in the past, there is a very strong association between past land use and disturbance and prevalence of invasives today can on some sites be um, quite a severe impact. So Allison, you want to expand on? Sure. Um, you know, we were looking at the, the data for the force inventory and analysis for Pennsylvania recently. And something like 60% uh, of the plot. So this is a survey of all forest land in the whole of the state and every state has this. Something like 60% of the plots in the, re the looking at young forests, what was gonna be there to establish next were negatively impacted by um, invasive or competitive native um, plants that were gonna prohibit the native species from coming back. So um, invasive species have, and non-native competitive species have become a real problem. And for people who are worrying about establishing the next forest, um, or if you're just letting your forest grow, you kind of got to gauge when, when disturbance may happen and kind of prepare for the potential expansion of those things in advance of that activity, if you can, if it's a planned activity. Um, and so really think about pick your battles and um, it may be that you're dealing with some sort of management and not necessarily eradication, control rather than eradication in terms of trying to, trying to help the natural process along, maybe the best that we can hope for in some of those cases where they're heavily, heavily impacted. Great, thank you both. Um, Roberta, do you have a question that you'd like to ask? I do. Um, I've recently uh, seen a number of presentations on climate change and their impact on forests. 
And one of them suggested that as trees come down or as people are doing timber harvesting, that they might be replacing with more Southern species. And I tried to correlate that to uh, things that I've heard from someone like Doug Ptolemy and how long uh, native insects and birds take to evolve to work with their species and wondered if you had any comments on how we might manage uh, native diversity along with the climate change? I know these, this is a huge question, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. And I can just comment briefly on it. I've been thinking about this. Um, yeah, I mean, what you're talking about is assisted migration, this idea that we take plants, trees from the South and we plant them up here. And um, so far that isn't happening on a large scale on the operational basis. It's primarily being done experimentally or on a small scale. And um, this is probably my, I'm gonna speak from my personal bias. And that is that I think that there is certainly value in looking at the feasibility of growing some species in more uh, northerly locations. But I think that as a wholesale solution to the problem seems um, like a big ask. And I think that in the near term, the best that I am trying to do and that I think we can all do is try to manage for healthy and vigorous forests. So as the stresses of climate change become more apparent, more periods of drought, more extreme weather events, if the trees in the forests we have are full of more healthy and vigorous trees, they will in theory, this is my thought, be better able to withstand those sorts of stresses. And I think where we're probably going to see the most, um, in addition to extreme weather events, which we're already seeing that, you know, blowing over trees unexpectedly and insects coming in that weren't before, I think where we're going to start having problems is with the regeneration. It's the new trees that are so sensitive when they're little and need to have moisture in certain conditions. And so, you know, I think certainly there is value in looking at planting some things maybe from a more southerly range and seeing how they go. But I agree with you that the rate of that um, and the likelihood of having a wholesale forest impact um, seem somewhat not feasible to me. So Alice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, the, the piece that I'm, I've been kind of on the fringes of is around seed sourcing. So looking at a range map, the, the amplitude of occurrence of species so not necessarily, so for us, say in Pennsylvania, we, we're we in an interesting place because we overlap southerly species. We're the northern end of southerly species and the southern end of northern species. And so moving things uh, within their range from say Virginia into Southern Pennsylvania has been talked about from a seed sourcing perspective. But um, I think absolutely echo what Laura just said in terms of considering uh, resilience and health. And there's some really good resources. Um, I know that folks in New York, and I think I saw Michigan most recently, and other states are talking about it too, have created a guide to help you evaluate your forest and then consider actions you can take for health and resilience in light of expected change from climate or other things. And so there's a really great guide uh, out there, and I'm sorry, I can't pull it off the top of my head, but I'm sure we can find it and make it available on the Guild site or on the Women Owning Woodlands site um, that would be uh, that would be useful, a useful tool to consider that. And I just want to mention before I forget, because I see Dakota that you put a note that we're starting to run low on time. If there's anyone's question that we don't get to today, please feel free to send me an email or Allison an email. Um, and I, I love to answer emails. It's a wonderful distraction from other work. So please send me an email if we don't get to your question and we can try to answer it. Yeah, thank you both so much. Um, I, will I, say I just I did find the resource, so I'm gonna put it in the chat box. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, great. And I saw that uh, someone asked a question about deer browse and trees that deer don't eat. And I think Leonora provided a, a resource as well. Um, before yeah, we all kind just, of hop, oh yeah. I just wanted to follow up real quickly on that deer browse thing. There's a bunch of different approaches. If you have special trees that you wanna protect on your property and not like, you know, on a large scale, every single tree basis, 
They, they sell um, sleeves that you can put over them, but you can also kind of make your own with, um, you know, chicken wire from the hardware store that is less expensive probably. So there's things you can do for special trees, but there's some great um, operational scale stuff going on now, leaving slash lying around if you have harvests, even that can help with your deer. So um, don't be discouraged on that. There, you can do things on a small basis, I guess I would say with little expense. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, so I just wanna mention, I think I'm gonna mention this and then there's one more question that I think we have time for. <laughs> but I did drop a survey into the chat box and I'll just drop it again. Um, if if y'all could take that um, before you leave today, just so we can know how we're doing and figure out uh, what was the best for you, that would be awesome. We'd love for you to answer those questions. Um, but then the last question I saw was, I don't, see the actual question, but I remember it was about prescribed fire and thoughts on managing forests with prescribed fire. And I don't recall if that person put um, where they were, but maybe just speak to New England and the fire regime of that again. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say real quickly up here, most of the forests aren't what we would call fire adapted or um, fire dependent. And so it isn't widespread practice in the part of the country where I come from. However, it is being done and, um, in some oak pine stands to try to improve regeneration. And there's a lot of great work about how effective that is out of Pennsylvania. And there's other places in the oak pine region. I saw we have Brian Lockhart here with us today where prescribed burning is very common because they're trying to maintain forest in that mid-successional stage. Those oak pine species are those mid-successional stages that Allison mentioned. Allison, where you have more of a Southern, you mentioned you're from the South, Let's bring it. <laughs> I am I burned a lot in the south, <laughs> but but even even in Pennsylvania, in our oak hickory, and we have a bit of northern hardwoods in the oak hickory. Yeah, like Laura said, there is a lot of um, potential to use that tool. Um, Jennifer puts that in the in the chat pod. The problem is finding someone to do it. Um, because of the resources needed to support it, the crews, the safety measures that have to be considered um, does make it somewhat prohibited for individual landowners to do it. So we tend to see it happening on, uh, say, Nature Conservancy land, Game Commission. Um, so yeah, there is, I think there is some movement in that direction towards creating uh, cooperatives or other ways to help it happen on private lands. But right now, that that uh, those requirements are proving somewhat prohibitive to that as a tool. Perfect. That's right on time, two o'clock. <laughs> Nicely done. Well, thank you both. And thank you, Olivia, too, for being the one to put together this, the publication that this whole series is based on. Um, and so if folks want to join us for the rest of the series, we have one every week for the rest of May. Next week, I believe, is about finding a consulting forester and like the steps to do that. So we'd love to see you all there. And this is has been recorded and we'll make that available if you wanna watch it again. Um, but thanks everybody. I hope you all have yes. a great afternoon and Thank thanks you Laura and Allison. Thank you. Bye.